First, we put our name down on the contract. And um, then we put um, a description of the property. And then we put the price of the property down. And then we date it and we sign it. And uh, the, we have a, in a unilateral contract, it's price for performance or price for the house. Is that a contract on a little bar napkin like that? Yes. yes. Really? It's, but it's just a bar napkin. You're missing something. What am I missing? What am I? Price, subject matter, identification of the party, description, signature, date, financial consideration. Terms. Consideration. Oh, the terms? Okay. Terms is good. Well, also, I said the price, so. Consideration doesn't have to be. Consideration is price or performance in a unilateral contract or a bilateral. Um, Performance or performance or price for price. Um, so we have those five or six integral things. They're signed, they're dated, it's bound by consideration, it has a description, the price, and all that other. Is that a napkin? Is that an enforceable agreement? Sure. It absolutely is. And there we go. So you have a you have a contract there. And contracts, I don't like, did anyone ever see these long, complicated? Boilerplate, small print, you can't, I can't even see them anymore. Contract. I, I have a theory. Keep it simple. Once again, if we take a contract and we have the, just the basics in there, um, and my contract's here, I'm going to give these to everybody, so don't worry. Um, let's not scare the heck out of the prospect. Let's give them something real simple. Let's have the basics in there. I know there's a, a lot of a lot of contracts and they get they go on and on and on and they have every every consideration in it and some uh, jurisdictions have uh, things that you have to have by law in there lead paint and things like that disclosures but basically if we keep it real simple do you think they're more likely to sign it? Okay. How many pages is the uh, San Diego Board of Realty contract now? Is it about 18 pages? Yeah. And it's not in what do you call it? It's five pages per page. Quintuplet? <laughs> what do you call it? Quintuplet? Is it, is, it, is it five or four pages per page in the contract? Yeah. Oh, okay. Ten pages and then you have your other... I mean, it, it's like war and peace. It's so thick it's war and peace. So my theory is let's keep our contracts, keep the basics, keep them very simple if we can. Yes, sir. Uh, Texas, these purchase. Uh, what's, what's your take on okay, let's let's hold off on that. Let's take uh, that's a great question, right. but that's a whole seminar. <laughs> okay. Texas, I, are you, you're from Texas, that's right. Bring, get me back to that if we have time. I don't know how much time okay. I have budgeted for this. But. Yeah, we set off on or something. And, yeah. So um, keep your contracts simple, basic. My contracts, uh, I tend to keep them very short. Doesn't mean we can't add things to it, codicils, a jet, addendums, and things like that. But I don't want to scare the prospect. And I think if I give them logically a simple agreement, and I say, here's the price of terms we discussed, Mr. and Mrs. Prospect, this is what's going to happen, um, they'll sign it. And that's my goal. My goal is not for them to say, what do they What do they say when they see a real complicated, long contract? What are some of the things They're you They're going to take it to their attorney. Right. <laughs> oh, so what do you say? What's a response? What's a guts response? Well, Jeff, I want to take it to my attorney. Right. Good answer. That's right. Why is that a smart answer? Strong. Okay. What happens if you say the other thing? They're going to be defensive. Things. Right. Oh, what's he got to hide? And the other thing on the phone is slim, so yeah. they just want to move forward. Yeah. So what happens if you go, you know what, Mr. Someone asked me, gee, I want to take it to my turn. I don't I agree. You know what? That's very smart. That's astute of you. If I was in your position, I'd do the same thing. But is there something I can, I keep my contracts very simple. I have all the price and the terms that we discussed right here. I'd be glad to explain to you anything you'd like to know, and maybe I can save you some money. Is your attorney your brother-in-law or something, or you, you wouldn't have to pay him, right? For her, uh, he's three fifty now. It's a lot of money, and I know you and your wife are watching your budget. And I'm not saying not to go, but maybe I can answer some questions and help you out. Awesome. Difference? Same See that? That's pure guts. Don't argue with them because they'll get defensive right away. <laughs> what should be in a good contract? Uh, just the things we discussed. One of my favorite passages in a contract is the right of assignment. Um, 
Under the law, if there is nothing in a contract that says you cannot assign it, then there's an assumption that you can assign it. Was that as clear as mud? It makes total sense to me. <laughs> Did that make sense to everybody? It's a little confusing. So as long as there's not a passage that says you cannot assign it, there is an assumption you can. I choose to have a paragraph uh, in my contracts that say I do have the right of assignment. Um, that right gives me the ability to sublet, transfer, or convey my rights to a third party. That means when I do a lease purchase or any other kind of contract, I can live in it myself. Okay, my house in Colorado was a lease purchase. I didn't know if I wanted to live at 10,000 feet with 400 inches of snow. I didn't know if I had a good roof. Roofs are very expensive in Colorado with all the snow and ice on them and ice dams and things. So we lived in it. We fell in love with it. The owner came back to us and gave us a better deal during the period of the option, lease option. Yes, Larry? How much of an option fee do you pay? $5,000. Wow. Yeah. Uh, that house is, is worth a lot more now. It's a seven-figure house now. Um, for five thousand, we tied it up, and it went up in value. It's in a, and we expanded on it and things like that. But um, so the right of assignment, you can live in it, you can rent it out to somebody, you can lease per a sandwich, lease purchase it, you can sell the contract. That's what Joe mentioned before, the arbitrage. Can you sell contracts? Oh yeah. yeah. You guys are a little too happy back oh, there. We just got a deal. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know you can just take these contracts as paper. If you, how many people are good at sniffing out finding deals? Some some people are really good at that. You can you're great at discovering deals. You know you go through Zillow and MLS and stuff. You find a deal, you get it under a contract, and then you sell it or arbitrage it. it means controlling a commodity with the intent to turn it over to someone else and make yourself an upfront profit. That's arbitrage, okay? And you can make very good money if you know how to sniff out deals. Wholesaling, is better. arbitraging, I use the words interchangeably, maybe Joe doesn't, but uh, sell that deal to either another investor or sell it to someone who wants to live in the property. And make sure you have a passage in there if something goes wrong, maybe you can turn it back, give it back to the owner and get out of it. So there's a lot of different variables in contracts. Yes, sir. So uh, arbitrage, is that simply just getting something at a certain price or perhaps yeah. a discount and then reselling it at a spread? Could, could be a discount. Spread. Arbitrage is making a spread. Okay. Yeah. It could be a discount. Say i got a property for uh, 100000 It's worth 120. Maybe I can sell it to somebody and make 5000 They make fifty. Maybe I have a deal like the one we did earlier where the owner financing. Who do I do that deal with? Everybody, right? Say I got a property, I give them the over market price, but I have owner financing in the property for five years. Is that of value to somebody who's going through a divorce or bankruptcy or something like that? They have some cash, but the credit's an issue with banks right now. You think I have something marketable when I have a property for five years with owner financing in it? Principal, you better believe it. You better believe it. And it doesn't always have to be principal only or interest only. It could be advertised. And I would advertise uh, property for sale, no bank required, owner financing. Why are you renting when you can own? You know, what do you think is going to happen to the phone? These are the things you can do with contracts. Joe Lowe, well, let me let you jump in here. When you were doing a lot of these first, I know you still do that. When you were really heavily involved in the club, yes. doing a lot of these first, what percent of your deals did you stay in the middle of which percent did you have You know what's a good question? When I first start, when I first started, I gave you one. You want two? Uh, when I first started, all I did was sandwich leasing. I was in love with sandwich leasing. We got one? Good, good. I think we have oh, we Okay. Everybody got one? You guys need another one? Yes. Okay. Um, when I first started, all I did was sandwich leasing. I was in love with sandwich leasing. Um, I started doing it with my own properties because I got a better quality tenant. I got tenants who actually paid on time. That was my biggest problem. Tenants don't, anybody here, you know, uh, have tenants who don't pay on time besides me? Okay, and that's what it was in normal rental because the attitude is, oh, the rich landlord. So we had to stimulate, motivate them, give them incentives. And lease purchasing, sandwich lease purchasing did that for me. And 
they took care of the property as, as part of the contract. So I love sandwich leasing. I did it with my own properties. Eventually I ran out of money and credit and I couldn't buy any more properties. So I started buying the controlling other people's properties and negotiating the price and terms. And then I'd sublet them or sandwich lease them. I'd pass on, if I got it for five years, I'd sublet it for one year at a time. Why, why one year at a time, by the way? Yes. That's fun. I discovered something. Tenants don't, um, they don't change their habits. They don't um, work on their credit or save up enough down payment. So they, uh, one year goes very quickly. And then I call them at the 11th, 12th month and I say, would you like to uh, renew your option or extend it or whatever? I say, well, yeah, are you ready to buy it? And they'd say, no, I can't buy it right now. I thought we need another year. Okay, more option money. Can I adjust the price and the rent if the market goes up? Better believe it. There's a time value on a lease option, a sandwich lease option. And um, so I did those, they worked fine. And then I studied more and more about assigning or arbitraging, where take a contract and instead of collecting the rent from the tenant and then paying the owner and being the middleman, okay, a pseudo management company, if you will, um, it was just much easier to sell the contract. And now I'm done with the whole thing. I have no more liability. I don't have to collect the rent. I just got that assignment fee. Assignment fee is different from option money. Okay, it's just you're selling the contract. You're selling the value of it. This is the same thing they do in the uh, calls and puts on stocks or uh, options, pork bellies and things like that. So is that a pure option? Um, a pure option is an option absent a lease. It's just where you get a property with no lease. You get a, a, a house or a piece of land for X amount of dollars with a time frame on it. You can buy this house for $100,000 over the next three years, and I sell it to an investor, a developer, or somebody wants to let their cattle run on the land or something like that. That's just a pure option is an option absent a lease. There's so many different configurations on lease options, but the beautiful thing is the operative word is leverage. The contract gives you leverage. Somebody else, think about it this way, somebody else bought the property, somebody else had to qualify for the bank, put down money, pay the insurance, pay the taxes, pay the homeowner fees, all that stuff. And we come in and we negotiate a contract on this property with the right of assignment so we can do all these different things with it and, and just sell the contract to somebody else or sandwich lease it or sublet it or live it in ourselves. And if something goes wrong, we get 2008, the market crashes, can we, are we the owner? of the property? Can we let the option expire and give it back to the owner and just walk away from it, no consequence? Or can we re give it back, can we renegotiate the deal and give it back to the owner? We kind of have, I love options because it embraces everything about leverage. We have our cake and eat it too. Um, I like, you know, I call wholesaling lease options because I thought, why, because I love lease options, you can control property without owning it. And I, I loved wholesaling because it was a quick way to make cash. And I didn't have Claude's system at the time. And so I thought, well, why can't I wholesale lease options? So I started doing that, and I thought, you know, that's a pretty catchy name. I'll yes. just see if the domain is still available. And the domain was available, wholesaling lease options. So I got the domain, and I got wholesale lease options, and flipping lease options, and leaseoptionflips.com. And I this is a I'm sorry to interrupt, but he was the originator of that. Yeah. Nobody else was doing that. Remember what I said about branding and being original this morning? This guy did it and built himself a, a hell of a nice business. Well, I, I, I just called it something different. Yeah, yeah that's I all. Invent the strategy. Yeah. I just called it something different. And uh, so I, I got the domain wholesaling lease options, and I thought I could maybe teach people how to do this. And I could maybe do some coaching. So I started teaching that. I've always tried to, I've changed my contracts a few times over the years. Um, I found though that every time I complicate the contract and make it bigger, it's just, it's, I keep on going back to the simpler contract. You know, it doesn't have to be complicated. Um, so, I mean, the, the contracts I'm using now is from an attorney in Ohio. Um, he has an escrow company. The company's name is Avalon Escrow. And uh, it's a real simple, the first off, the first contract I give them, I actually borrow from Claude with permission, a short offer form. Yeah. It's just on one page, it's the lease and the option. And I, that's the number, when I'm going to, um, 
That's the first prop the th first thing I give them to get it under contract. Then I'll decide whether if I'm going to stay in the middle or if I'm going to arbitrage it or okay. So then if I know I'm going to flip it, I'll start advertising it for a higher price. When I find a tenant buyer that I feel has a realistic shot of getting a mortgage in one or two years, I will this is the way I do it. I'll give the seller a new contract, a new lease, and a new option. I'll make them separate for the higher price. And then I assign those two new, and those two new contracts replace the original one. I sign those with the seller, and then I immediately assign those contracts to the tenant buyer, and then I'm out of the deal. That tenant buyer, there's an assignment agreement that I use, and I make the seller sign it. What's important, that seller doesn't have to approve that tenant buyer. Because if you do, if you let them approve it, that could be considered a broker, right? But this tenant, the seller still needs to sign my assignment agreement. I just do that to make it sure I'm covered. The seller signs the assignment agreement, as does me and the tenant buyer. Now it's a contract between the tenant buyer and the seller, right now. My assignment fee, um, the way we structure it is we, we never say anything in the contract that they get that back as part of their down payment. Oh. Down payment is a dirty word for this purpose. My mortgage, do it. mortgage brokers I work with are down payment. I just, it's, uh, it's an assignment. But, but um, my, my mortgage broker, if you present it right to the right bank, you can a lot of times get that assignment fee to be assigned credited towards a down payment. And the reason I use this third party escrow service is because in a year or two years when that tenant buyer is giving their paperwork or whatever, they can show a check made out to an escrow company. And that helps make it a lot easier. But you gotta make sure you're working with the right mortgage broker who knows how to present it the right way to the bank without raising a bunch of red flags. And then typically, you know, at that point, um, you know, a mortgage broker will will they'll get a new um, They'll, get, they'll create a new, uh, what do you call it, sales contract. At that point, they create a new sales contract. And if I have rent credits, you know, they'll work it out so that it meets the bank's criteria. So either the rent credits will be seller concessions or closing costs, or they'll just reduce the price of the home. Um, so that kind of stuff I let the mortgage broker and the seller buyer worry about. Figure. But I never promised that assignment fee to go towards their future down payment. Does that make sense? I would, I change one thing, actually, if I may. Um, do it almost exactly the same, except I do it in reverse, where we we have a contract with the seller, a lease and option. We sign a lease and option with the tenant buyer. Their option consideration, we, we basically raise the price of their option. They get credited for their option consideration. I mean, it, it doesn't change any of the numbers except it makes them feel good. You know, I'm actually charging them a higher price, and then I take their paperwork and assign it all back to the seller. And again, you you know, you can't say that it's a down payment. I say it, it varies by the lender. You know, so everything else is exactly the same as what Joe does. We just do it in reverse as far as who, who assigns what. Yeah. There, there's a difference between the option fee or the assignment. Yes. Going towards the purchase price yes. and a down payment or Absolutely. deposit, right? Yeah. But that's what we're saying, right? Is did you put it towards yeah. the purchase price? It's not down payment. It's not yeah, and I just I just tell them I, I don't know. It depends cool. on your lender. Right. Yeah. Cool. That's and that kind of goes to your question uh, earlier uh, about opening escrow and what Joe was talking about. Joe's talking about a very formalized right. method, and it's great. He's creating a paper trail. Everything. Now, a lot of, um, in my experience, a lot of tenant buyers never exercise the option. Okay, and um, I keep it fairly simple. Um, I'll, I'll either sub if I sublet it and I'm in the middle, I can control certain things. Okay, uh, and in most cases, they either convert to a month-to-month -month rental because the option expires, or they move out. If I do an assignment. Um, the best part of the assignment, in my viewpoint, is I'm out of the deal. I don't want any further uh, part in that transaction. So I, in many cases, if I um, 
uh, I'll just step out and um, if they want to open escrow, fine. If they want to do whatever they want to do, it's fine. But I'm out of the deal. I'm not there to advise them or play a, play a part anymore. I make my money on the assignment fee. The assignment fee does not go towards the, uh, it's, it's, it's usually not applied to the transaction. It's a separate distinct fee that I'm paid for finding the deal, negotiating it, putting in a contract, and I literally sold the contract like I sell a car to somebody else. But would it be worthwhile to just do a paper adjustment of the purchase price? Yeah, and you could do that too. And I, I'm just trying to, there's so many, here's the problem, yeah. there's so many variables. You know, Joe can do it one way, Mariska can do it another, I can do it another. Uh, we can call, we can call option money, and a traditional option would apply to the deal traditionally. An assignment fee could apply to the deal if you wanted okay. to structure it that way. I choose to keep it as a separate, distinct fee. And the only reason, I mean, we started having the, um, the, the tenant buyer sign the paperwork, well, well, there's two reasons. One is we wanted them to feel like that money that they were paying, that they were getting a lot of value for it. Um, and so having it apply towards the purchase accomplished that. But the other thing is, is they like to see their name on the lease. They mm -hmm. like their signature to be on the lease. Whereas if it's with the seller and then it's assigned to them, they, they feel, I mean, it doesn't matter, an assignment's assignment, but they feel better if they're signing the lease and then say, like, no, I'm gonna sign everything back to the seller and I'm out of the deal, I'm done. Okay. And they know that, they see my assignment agreement and everything, but. So it's just the same, just a really different way. So what do you, <laughs> One of the things that uh, may be difficult is you're advertising this contract for five thousand dollars as an assignment. <clears throat> what do you say with the seller? The tenant buyer wants to know if that money could get back applied to the down payment when they buy it in two years. Okay, uh, very upfront about it, uh, Mr. Ten uh, Mr. Assigning, Mr. Tenant Buyer. Uh, we found this deal, uh, we negotiated, we embodied it in a contract, and we're selling it for $5,000, which does not apply to the deal. Now, and I'm just very upfront about it, um, they don't know how to put these transactions together. That's the service I provide, and I sell that contract as, and the, the deal is, the, uh, my fee is separate, and the deal is in the contract. Now, here's the exception. This is where it gets confusing, I'm sorry. I can negotiate, there's, there's ways you can negotiate a contract with the owner that the assignment fee would apply to the purchase price. You can do that too. It's a very flexible instrument. Okay. Okay. Though you, gotta, you can get away with that if it's a good deal, right? Yeah. If it's a marginal deal and you're selling the option, if the option price is current market value or higher, rent is current market That's value. That's when, exactly. So if yeah. it's going to be easier for you to just do an assignment if the terms are really good in that contract. And you can say, look, this is a great smoking hot deal. If you want it or not, it's going to cost you five grand. If it's marginal, mm -hmm. right, then maybe you should think about adding some language to the seller's contract that you're going to get back. Yep, five thousand. I'll go, yeah, I'd go to the, that's right. I'd go to the owner, uh, Mr. Huerta, you want 100000 for your property. I, uh, I'm going to assign this to somebody who's pre-qualified. Would you mind if we adjust the purchase price to 105000 because I'm going to sell it for five, and I think that person would like that money applied to the deal. So I can, I can just, I can, you know, adjust the price in terms in there uh, on that type of situation. Yes, sir. So, so to get